Good evening. I am sure, above all things, that you will not grasp the full import of this class for a long time to come. And those of you who will find it possible to hear these tapes once, twice, or three times afterward, after the class is over, will be fortunate, and the tapes will be available throughout the world. Because we have gone into an area of consciousness this trip in this particular work that has not been touched before because we were not ready for it. And uh, a spiritual work can only be given in degrees. We advance to a certain level of consciousness, a certain plateau, and we rest a while. And then we take another step forward, and we rest a while to catch up. And then on again, and so forth. There's no end to this. And of course, we have stepped in this class right across the barrier. We have made the transition from human consciousness to the divine. And I myself know how long it takes after we have received instruction before we attain the consciousness of what we now intellectually know. One of these questions is, the veil was rent. When we rip the human concepts of material processes, is this the same as rending the veil to the Holy of Holies in the Hebrew temple? Is this the I, Christ, recognizing itself? And uh, I would like you to know that whoever wrote that question tuned in on the subject of tonight's work. The answer will be in this entire work tonight. In your writings, you say we do have a material body as an instrument for our activity and expression. Where do flesh and body fit into the spiritual scheme? And here also the answer will be in tonight's work. As it is, that particular question is answered in a particular tape called Flesh and Flesh. You remember that in scripture, flesh is used in two ways. Yet in my flesh shall I see God, and uh, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. In one sense, flesh is used as a word meaning corruption, that is the fleshly sense of existence. In another sense, it is used uh, as the substance of our spiritual bodies. And so I believe you will see how the body may be described as a spiritual body, and yet in another sense that we may call it the body of corruption. In one sense we may call it the spiritual body or temple of God, and yet in another sense refer to our bodies as illusion. Let us return to our subject of creation. Until you rightly understand creation, you will not understand the subject of prayer and of meditation. Because the object of prayer, the purpose of prayer and meditation, is to get back to creation, to rend that veil of illusion that separates us from reality. And so now let us watch creation. And we start always with the word God, in the beginning God. But since God 
using the word God would indicate something separate and apart from ourself, something other than ourself. Let us start with the truth that I am God. I. Consciousness, if you like. Consciousness is God. But all I am is consciousness, therefore I am God. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. So we start creation with the word consciousness or I, and since there cannot be an unexpressed consciousness, that would be unconsciousness, in order for there to be consciousness, there must be consciousness expressed. Consciousness manifested, or I expressed, I manifested. Whatever consciousness is as manifestation, let us call that man, or let us go further, let's call that individual being. Let us say that I, God, manifest as I, the Son. Now you have scriptural authority for that. God the Father, God the Son, one and the same. So I, God, manifest individually as I, the Son. S-O-N. Now, you see, do you not, that consciousness is inseparable and indivisible from itself. Therefore, I, the Son, am forever in and of I the Father, for we are one. I, God being infinite, nothing can exist outside of I. Therefore I the Son exist in and as I the Father, or rather I the Father exist in and as I the Son, and the Son and the Father. Thou and me, and I'm in thee, and we're both in the Father. I, God, manifest as I, the Son of God, and in this light, you see that the qualities of God are manifest as the qualities of the Son. The qualities of consciousness, infinite consciousness, are the qualities of individual consciousness. Because we only had the one consciousness forming itself as individual, you and me. But since we are formed of consciousness, the essence and substance of our being and activity of our being is, of course, the essence, substance, and being of God, the I. Therefore, the Father says, Son, thou art ever with me, all that I have is thine. All you have to do is keep that word I in mind. All that I have, I, divine consciousness, is thine, individual consciousness. Now, by this means, you do not live by might or by power, you are living by my spirit, by my consciousness. That is, the consciousness of the Father is the consciousness of the Son. The life of the Father is the life of the Son. The soul of the Father is the soul of the Son. And therefore, we have a life not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, scripturally called a life by grace. In other words, a life lived as the gift of God because we are heirs of God. We are heirs of God because everything God has is ours. All that God has is our possession because we are imbued with God. We are formed of the substance of God. And this entire creation is spiritual. Now remember, that in this creation, this a spiritual creation, I the Father manifesting as I the Son, infinite divine consciousness manifesting as individual consciousness, 
yet always remaining one. And here you have spiritual perfect creation. Now, something happens, and we're not going to waste any time asking why it happened, how it happened, how could it happen. All we are going to do is accept the fact that one day Joel was born, and you can substitute your own name. But as far as I'm concerned, one day Joel was born. And he had no awareness of his original spiritual identity. He was quickly told that he had two human parents, which was a lie because there is only one parent. And that is the divine consciousness which I am and which I manifest as individual being. But I'm told now that I'm a child and I have human parents and uh, it isn't long till I'm told that I have to work for a living. And soon after that I discover that everything and everybody in the world is a boss over me. From the time I'm bossed by my parents and bossed by my aunts and uncles and bossed by my school teachers and then bossed by employers, later on bossed by the government and put in a uniform, <laughs> and finally bossed by an income tax department that just determines to take up its abode on your neck. <laughs> now remember that all of this time I am not aware of the fact that I don't have to earn my living by the sweat of the brow, that no one has dominion over me. I have been imbued with a God-given dominion over everything in the earth and the heavens and in the waters beneath. But I don't know this. I am ignorant of my identity. I'm ignorant of the fact that I am heir to a tremendous fortune, all of the spiritual riches. I am ignorant of the fact that my life is God. And the first thing you know, I'm protecting my life and medicating my life and doing all sorts of things to a life that is already infinite that cannot be changed. In other words, I am now growing up in ignorance, in ignorance of the truth about myself, about my Creator, about my nature and character, about my being, about my life, about my body. Certainly I'm in ignorance about my dominion. And so I'm living in a little world of human creation, a world that my grandparents and great-grandparents helped to create in their mind and pass on to me, and my parents and my school teachers. They got me into a little world in which I am almost a nonentity, struggling with three billion other people for a livelihood, and with everybody in the world having jurisdiction over me. Now, I try my best to get along in this world, and I don't have to tell you that I am in the same position that you've been in not finding this world a very satisfactory place. Not disliking it enough to want to commit suicide to get out of it, yet disliking it enough to uh, resort to all kinds of escapisms to avoid having to face the fact that I am a known entity, struggling for survival against terrible odds, and with almost no say over my own life. In Scripture, this life of ours that I have just described to you is termed the prodigal experience. This son, who was heir to great riches and a kingdom, authority and power, he wanders off from his father's house into a far country. And remember, that's what happened to us. We were born 
We certainly were in a far country, far from our father's house, completely unaware of our true identity and with a sense of self. I must fend for myself. I must protect myself. I must support myself. I, 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 as if there really were an I separate and apart from the great I that I am. And so here is this little I on a merry-go-round, traveling fast and going nowhere, and eventually realizing the unsatisfactoriness <coughs> of that condition. Now, there are many people, many millions of people, who go through an entire lifetime kicking against this kind of a life and doing nothing about it and passing on and have to come back and do the same parade all over again. But there are some who reach a place for one reason or another which is described as the banquet with the swine, the prodigal son's last ditch in which he realizes that he just couldn't be worse off. Even the servants in my father's house are better than, off than I am. And I'm an heir. But we, when we reach that estate where we realize this is the worst kind of a world, nothing could be worse than this, we don't even know that we're an heir. But having heard of God, the word begins to circulate or percolate in our thought and most of us have come to the place where we say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, you talk about a God, but surely any God worth the name of God couldn't be responsible for this chaos on earth. Any God worthy the name of God couldn't possibly tolerate my being in this condition that I'm in, condition of sin or sickness or lack, unhappiness. Wars, slavery. And so we begin to puzzle about that word God. And if we allow ourselves to puzzle with it just a little while, a miracle sets in and off we are on a search for God or a search for truth. Our footsteps may lead us into different uh, forms of religion and we may battle those through for a whole lifetime or two or three before we wake up to the futility of it but eventually if that word God is still percolating in our consciousness if we're still puzzling how there can be a God and these troubles eventually we are going to be led to one of the metaphysical or spiritual approaches to religion. And it really makes no difference which one we're led to because they all take us away from <clears throat> the orthodox beliefs that have kept us in darkness and in ignorance, in superstition, in paganism. And uh, eventually we will work around through one or more of these metaphysical approaches until we find ourselves on a path that will lead us back to the kingdom within. Now, here is what happens. This Joel out here in the world, <clears throat> oh, let's put it the other way. Let's go back to to this individual <clears throat> expression of God, which I am, and say that this human Joel <clears throat> has that divine Joel hidden way down inside in consciousness, so deep down that there's no awareness of it being there. So that all the time that I'm walking around, working hard to earn a living, struggling with sin and disease, 
all of this time my real self, that free and independent self, that individualization of all that God is, is hidden inside of me, inside of my consciousness. It is probably rolled up like a ball, tight. The Orientals call it an onion. And the reason they do <coughs> is that they have discovered that this process of knowing the truth, of searching for God, is like taking a skin from the onion, one onion skin from the onion. It doesn't seem to do much toward getting to the center, but nevertheless, something has happened even with the removal of one onion skin, one layer. And so it is that as we imbibe truth through knowledge of truth, through devotion to truth, through meditation, layer after layer of this human jowl falls away. Layer after layer of this outer false self drops away. In the case of the onion, if you just keep on long enough, you get down to a place where all that's left is nothing. After every skin has been removed, there is nothing left there but nothing. And that nothing is the I that I am. That nothing is spiritual. That nothing is the essence of life. You can watch this operate. If you plant a seed in its native soil, eventually it breaks open and then begins to take root. Now what caused it to break open? Examine that seed under any kind of a glass you like and you will not detect anything that could make it break open. And the reason is that there is an invisible life, an invisible presence or power operating in and through that seed that breaks it open. So it is that when you finish taking every skin off of the onion and you have nothing left, you have that nothing which is all. You remember the scripture, he hangeth the earth on nothing. That's the very nothing that you find in the center of that onion, and that is the very nothing that you find when you take away from us every bit of our humanhood. When you take away from us every single bit of carnality, sensuality, selfishness, self-preservation, when you have completely divested yourself of self there is nothing left. And nothing should be spelt with a capital N because that nothing is the I that I am. And if you wish to follow that, remember our exercise of going from head to foot and from foot to head and finding that I am not in the body. Then where am I? And what am I? I am certainly nothing. Nothing that you can see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. I am nothing that you could get your mind on or your fingers on. Because I'm nowhere between the toenails and the top of the head. You cannot grasp me because if you try, you get your hands on nothing. And that's what I am. Consciousness, spirit, nothing tangible, nothing physical, nothing mortal, nothing material. And in that non-tangibility or corporeality, you have me as I am, that I am that I was in the beginning with God. That incorporeal selfhood, that real selfhood. Therefore, from the moment 
that I awakened to the fact that there cannot be God and all of this mortality, from that moment on I was praying. Now, you can call it searching for God, you can call it searching for truth, you can call it being a truth student, you can call it being a, a monk or a nun, you can call it anything you like, but what it is is praying. You are praying your way back home, and every thought you think is a prayer. Every thought that you think in the direction of getting back out of this mortality is a prayer and a meditation. And uh, the object of prayer, then, is to strip this outer sense of self away until I get back into the withinness of my own being and there find myself to be the I that I am. And this is said to be returning to the Father's house, to be robed again in the royal robes of a prince, of an heir, and given the royal ring of authority. Well, this is symbolic. It merely means that I have jumped out of my mortal skin back into my spiritual identity, and now I can say, yes, I know that I am. I know that I am. Then, in proportion as we succeed, this is termed, symbolically, rending the veil. This is also termed recognizing our Christhood, our divine sonship. It usually happens in the way that it did with Peter first recognizing that Jesus is the Christ. It is so much easier for us to recognize Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jesus, John, Paul, Buddha, Lao Tzu, as the Christ than it is to believe that we are the Christ because we are too aware of our human failings ever to want to associate ourselves by name or nature with the Christ. <clears throat> but we can look out upon those who have attained illumination and agree that they are. But it only means that in the end you have to come back to yourself. Otherwise you would be setting up another dynasty of someone greater than thou. Now, if you are wise... You never call your humanhood the Christ, nor do you try to make your humanhood spiritual. And that is why there is never any reason to bemoan the fact that you are not humanly perfect while you're on this path and uh, seeking your true identity. That none of us can be humanly perfect. That's an impossibility. And if we were, we might well defeat our journey. I would have you know that one of the dangers on this spiritual path is that we might make too good a demonstration too soon. More people on the spiritual path lose their demonstration because they attain health or supply or companionship in a hurry. And they're so happy with it, they rest in it. And you see, for this incarnation, they have lost out. The moment you are satisfied with yourself, with your demonstration, with your supply, with your companionship, you have lost the opportunity for attaining heaven. It is only in our dissatisfaction with our humanhood, even when it's good, it is only in our dissatisfaction with it that we go higher. We quickly get away from unhappy humanhood and unhealthy humanhood 
but we have a slower journey when we try to get above healthy humanhood and wealthy humanhood. In the same way that the church person who is very righteous has a hard time ever getting to heaven. You know that. The Master warned about that. The scribes and the Pharisees were the two righteous sects, and they couldn't get into heaven. Because it is a righteousness, a sort of self-righteousness, I am good, I am honest, I am moral, I am religious, I go to church, I do charity, and that's the finest way in the world to lose one's spiritual demonstration because it bolsters the ego. And sometimes even metaphysical students who have attained health and supply brag about it as if they'd accomplished uh, Christhood itself. Instead of realizing that it may be an indication of progress on the way. But it isn't Christhood. Christhood is when you've gone beyond good humanhood, gone beyond happy humanhood, gone behind righteous humanhood or wealthy humanhood, and pierced that veil until you behold your identity. Now, there are steps along the way, and here are some of them. When we come to a place in this search for God or search for truth where we are convinced that there is a way to return to the Father's house, there is a way to be reestablished in our divine and spiritual selfhood. Now we have to find a way, a method, a process of returning. And on this particular path, the infinite way, we have uh, a preliminary step, which we call practicing the presence of God, taken, of course, from Brother Lawrence's title and mode of life, but actually taken from Scripture. The way this practice was revealed to me was not so much through Brother Lawrence as it was through Scripture. Such passages as, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, or abide in the word and let the word abide in thee, or he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, or lean not unto thine own understanding, acknowledge him in all thy ways. This gave me the cue on which this original practice of the presence of God was founded in the infinite way. And it meant this. It meant that I, Joel, this outer Joel, has recognized that there is a presence within me. He that is within me is greater than he that is in the world. Now, I don't know the nature of it. I don't know the name of it. I only have come to the conviction that there is a he within me, if only I can get there and get my hands on him, my mental hands at any rate. And uh, so I start my career by pondering this presence within. <clears throat> you might call it a contemplative form of meditation. I didn't know it as such at that time, but that's what it was. It was where I would sit quietly and think to myself. I know now, I'm convinced now, there is a he within me. There is a presence within me of some kind of a spiritual nature of some kind, something the Master called the Father within, something Jesus called the indwell I mean, Paul called the indwelling Christ, something the Buddha called me, search after me and you will find me. And so I would sit and contemplate this, 
there is something within me. There is a presence, there is a power. There is a God or a Christ or an indwelling spirit. There, the scripture says there is a spirit in man. <laughs> there is something which if I can contact or awaken or find will do things for me. And there again scripture comes out and says it is a presence that goes before you to make the crooked places straight. It goes before you to prepare mansions. And so begins what we will call practicing the presence of God. It is a pondering or a contemplating of whatever it is that is within us that is of a spiritual nature. And so in our particular work you will find in the book Practicing the Presence and in the book Art of Meditation all that is necessary to begin that kind of a life of dwelling on the in dwelling spirit, abiding in the word, abiding in God and letting God abide in you. And uh, you will at first say that this is duality to which I plead guilty. There are people who cannot enjoy the infinite way because it is the absolute. It has duality, to which I plead guilty. I know that I cannot start out by saying I am God because I'm faced with all the mistakes of my humanhood and I call myself a liar. So rather than call myself God and make a fool of myself, I acknowledge that there is something of God about me or within me, that there is something to be attained, something to be known. And so I ponder it and its qualities and its nature and its activity. And of course I have all of the scripture of the world for authority on this, that if I keep it up, if I abide in the Word and let the Word abide in me, if I will ponder this indwelling something, that eventually, and if I rely on it more and more, lean more unto it than unto my outer assets, eventually I'll come closer to a realization of it. And what we have discovered in the infinite way is this, that if you continue with the practicing, the presence of God, meditating, pondering the word, that eventually you come to such an inner stillness that the outside world does not trouble you so much, you do not react to it so much, and uh, it becomes less and less real to you. You begin to fear less the powers of this world. You begin to have a greater reliance, a greater confidence in the infinite invisible. You are beginning to transfer your faith and your fears in the outer world to a conviction and assurance and an inner peace within yourself. This, of course, leads to longer and longer periods of meditation. Now, students who try to meditate for long periods usually find themselves in trouble because not only it isn't easy, but for most people it's impossible. That transition from living out here in the baubles to living quietly inside is a difficult transition. And uh, sometimes it leads to getting mixed up in a lot of mental anxieties and really phobias. We recommend in our work that actual meditations be for a very, very short period of time. 
we might have three or four or five minutes of contemplative meditation when we are contemplating a truth or two, and then 10, 20, or 30 seconds of being still. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, and then listen. Just all you need is 10, 20, or 30 seconds. But if you do that 10, 12, 20 times a day, you will gradually find you are making a transition inside of yourself. And the process is this. Every time that you ponder a scriptural passage or dwell on the idea of God, the infinite and visible, you quiet down and then by declaring, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, you make yourself a state of receptivity. It is like creating a vacuum inside of you and then into that the spirit can rush. Now, you may for quite some time uh, not notice anything at all happening. Probably before you are aware of any change taking place within you, you will find a couple of things taking place in your external life that will bring to you the conviction that these brief periods of meditation are bringing to you the presence which goes before you. But eventually, these 10 seconds, 15, 20 seconds, will naturally lengthen themselves to 40, 50, 60 seconds, during which time you'll be completely at peace within. Remember, you have nothing to think about. You are now in an attitude of receptivity. You're in the attitude of letting God speak. And when he speaks, the earth melts. You will find by this process that you are changing the entire nature of your life. You are now bringing into actual demonstration that invisible spirit which has been locked up within you. That invisible selfhood, that invisible Christ. And now we'll use the word I. Listen to it when it says to you, I will never leave thee. Before Abraham was, I was with thee. I will be with thee to the end of the world. And now you'll know what that presence is within you. It's the word I. I am your meat and your bread and your wine and your water. I am the resurrection. And now you'll know that I is speaking to you. I is going before you to make the crooked places straight. I is going to prepare mansions for you. Now you'll know that it is your divine selfhood. Of course, we are still in duality because we still have this divine I, which I am, and we still have this Joel out here who has not entirely found his way home. He's getting closer. The Father is coming out to meet him. The I is announcing itself. And the I within and the Joel without are getting better acquainted. I think they're beginning to love each other. There is a warmth, an attachment developing. A companionship, a communion, it's still duality. The whole ministry of Jesus Christ was duality, except in the brief revelation in which he disclosed his true identity. But all the rest of it was, I and my Father, and the Father within me, the presence that is doing something. But eventually, if you abide in this word and let this word, if you begin to tabernacle with this divine spirit that is within you, if you begin to commune with it, get friendly with it, get to a place where you really can have nice conversations, a feeling of oneness with it, the day comes when 
in a deep, deep meditation, Joel disappears completely. All trace of him is lost, and only I remain. And you are looking out at this world, not as Joel, but as I, absolutely without physical form, absolutely incorporeal. You may be up in the sky looking down and under the ocean looking up, because now you fill all space. Just as God fills all space, so does God manifest, fill all, fill all space. And uh, you are that omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence while you're in the deepest part of that, and you have now found your way home. Well, at this point, <clears throat> the vast majority of those who have had the experience return to this world and continue the life of duality. They live the life of a human on earth, and at the same time, they live the life of spiritual entity within themselves. They live in two worlds. Many <clears throat> do not recapture the secret of what has taken place, and they live very unhappy lives because the experience never comes again, and they live wholly out here in their humanhood and never again return to their spiritual estate. One of these was a man who lived in this estate, I believe, three whole days, and then never again could return to it. And he had to have whatever joy he had out of life was just in remembering those three days. It isn't a very satisfactory way of life, I can tell you, because uh, that period of separation from yourself isn't the most pleasant thing in the world. But however, what I'm coming to is that there are records of some who have attained this full illumination and then passed on, left their bodies behind for burial or whatnot, and they went on to live the balance of their experience in this spiritual incorporeality. But of all of the great mystics, and more especially those who have founded religions, I mean original basic religions, the experience has been that they have been content to live on earth as humans while living inwardly in their spiritual life for the benefit of presenting their work, their revelation, their teaching to the world. In other words, giving the world the benefit of it. Now, sometimes this is a voluntary act on the part of the particular mystic who feels it is far more important to sacrifice himself to the life on earth for the greater good of others. And sometimes it is because the mystic is under orders from those spiritual lights who have left the corporeal scene. Because behind this world there is an hierarchy of those who have attained their full illumination and who still influence those on earth who are spiritually attuned. And so it is that sometimes under orders the mystic remains on earth or returns to earth if they have passed on for the purpose of conveying this message. What message? First of all, the message of two-ness, that there is a Father within you, and the closer you get to living with this Father, relying on this Father or Christ within or Spirit of God within, the more harmonious, joyous, and fruitful your outer life will be. And then secondly, revealing to those who are prepared for the sacrifice that is entailed, that is, the sacrifice of what you might call prosperous human living. In other words, the sacrifice of the human good, so as to live in uh, a dedication to service, 
to those the greatest revelation is given, and that is when the duality disappears and I reveals itself as individual being. Now to show this again, let me return to the I, God, that I am. I, infinite divine consciousness. And I, infinite divine consciousness, manifest as I, individual consciousness. So we might say then that God is incarnated as individual being. And this is your spiritual sonship or your Christhood. Now, in the case of Buddha, of Jesus, possibly of John, something further took place. The I that was God and that was manifested as I, the Christ or Son of God, permeated human consciousness. And uh, Jesus could say, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when he said that, his Jesushood was completely gone. You saw his physical body, but he didn't. He was looking out from the body of light. He was totally under, unaware of the mother that bore him or the brothers and sisters that were around him. He was aware only of himself, speaking as God, as that divine Christhood. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We would say, the I of me is Christ. We would say, Christhood is my real identity. That's still acknowledging uh, our Joel being. But he had reached the place where there was no more Jesus being. There was only the Father revealing himself as the Son. And the few great mystics who have attained that light have attained it as the Master did, not forever, only for periods of illumination. The rest of the time they lived in, you might call, three-quarter time. In other words, they lived 100% inwardly as Christ, but they also recognized the limitations of their physical form and were content to tabernacle among us as physical form. What I'm saying to you is that the ultimate of the search for God is attained through steps. First, through the recognition that whereas I am a human being to sense, there is a divinity within me, and then a getting back, a tabernacling, communing, acknowledging, until most of that human selfhood peels itself off, and you no longer are willing to enrich yourself at somebody else's expense or save your life by killing someone else. You have transcended that stage of humanhood, you're not interfering with what your government's doing. You're only living your own life. And uh, you are now in the relationship of uh, communing or tabernacling with the divine presence within you, which you're now beginning to recognize is really your true selfhood. This I that I am is my true selfhood, and this that walks the earth is the finite sense of it, the mask it's called, persona, personality, mask, human identity. But at least you do know now that I in the midst of me is mighty. Now you know that I in the midst of me is Christ and I carry my own Christ. Wherever I go, that Christ is my meat, my wine, and my water. It is my supply. It is my cement in human relationships. 
I do not have to look outside for any powers of good, and I do not have to fear any outside powers of evil, for I and the Christ of me is one, and this Christ of me is my divine selfhood, my divine protection, my divine maintenance and sustenance. And right here, let me read you again these few lines from Robert Frost. I turned to speak to God about the world's despair, but to make matters worse, I found God wasn't there. God turned to speak to me. Don't anybody laugh. God found I wasn't there, at least not over half. This, you see, is profound. This is what we are trying to say in the infinite way. Don't take your troubles to God. He isn't there. He isn't going to listen, and he isn't going to do anything about them. But God is speaking to you, and you must learn to listen until the voice of God speaks to you, through you, and destroys this world of error that you were trying to take up to God. Don't be concerned about taking your troubles to God. Take yourself to God and be where the voice of God can reach you. Then you'll find that this I, which is at the center of your being, will speak through you, to you, through you, to the world, and it will perform that which is given you to do. He that is within you will perform that which is given you to do. He will perfect that which concerneth you. Not by trying to carry your troubles up there, but by staying here at the center of your being, abiding there, and listening until that voice comes through. One of these days you will have an experience. It's described in uh, Infinite Way Letters 1955. One of the actual experiences that I had in transcending corporeality. These experiences are frequent ones with me, but they can be permanent ones at any time because I can walk in and walk out. It's a matter of, 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 